That's not the reason why. <laughs> That's not the reason why. The problem's not out there. You have to look inside. That thing that someone did. The words that seem to hurt are only in your mind. And that's where you must search. What I hear from you guys a lot is um, your group participates in no private thoughts and no people pleasing. Yes. And when we've talked about it, um, I mean, I've heard things said under that premise that are very hurtful. And I know that the course is always about being kind. So I wonder how you draw your lines on that and how you, you know, I mean, mindfulness on harmlessness, no harm, no injury of being kind. How do you deal with no private thoughts when you guys are spewing out things that could be hurtful? Not you in particular, but some of the times I've met with people from those groups, they've said, like our, our Mel had told me that, Eric had told her that she was fat one time, and I thought, wow, I mean, that, that could be suicide for some women. So I was just wondering how that, how that gets navigated through. Yeah, yeah, that's good. We have a, a process online that we've kind of put down called the clarity process because it's really getting at the essence of what you're saying. It's not, it's not kind of a formula or a ritual or just a license to say anything. Mm -hmm. um, because it, if it was just taken on the surface and maybe misinterpreted, it could seem like that's just a license to speak anything. Like speak a weapon. Yeah. yeah, and we're certainly not into any attempt to to blame or fault find or you know make guilty in any way. So really, there's an underlying presence underneath those principles. Um, it could be illustrated like when I went to China, for example, communist China. There's there's a lot of in the culture kind of a lot of systematic denial and repression. And so, for me going there and sharing those principles, it was like a green light to turn the table. Instead of re denying and repressing anything, they just would come out. And, and of course, it was almost like they were so eager to try them out that, that's, that we, a couple times I was over there, I was over there so maybe four times, um, a phenomenon happened over there that I had never seen in any of my gatherings anywhere in the other 30 countries was fights breaking out yeah. among core students, yeah. <laughs> physically, <laughs> and going after each other. Um, and the emotions were very raw, And but overall there was a context of, of great relief and joy, like when they, I would do an expression <laughs> session, I, they, I would come around and they would all get into a big circle with me to try to do a small group, but there was a hundred people there. So we had to do kind of a, a Gangaji hot seat thing and work that out so everybody could vicariously kind of join in in that way. But um, they were so grateful that they put a, put a chair and they put me in the middle of the group and then another chair and then one by one they would come out and express to me and let up and cry and let up all their emotions. So we're talking about a sense of presence or non-judgment and practicing the presence and then there's an, a great allowance to let the thoughts and the emotions up, which is a first step in healing if they've been denied from awareness. And so when we say no private thoughts, it's not meaning that you should not have private thoughts, it's really taking from the workbook where Jesus says, um, you have no private thoughts, and yet that's all that you are aware of. Mm -hmm. So we have to start with where the mind seems to be, and kind of release the pressure, and let that come up. But there's, in the clarity process, we have things that are very similar to nonviolent communication techniques. Um, you know, not, no crosstalk, uh, not cutting people off, interrupting people, let people go through, let their emotions up, no advice giving, Occasionally we'll, you know, we'll have the armchair psycho psychologist or psychotherapist that as soon as somebody just begins to get in touch with their emotions and their thoughts, there's this advice that will come in, almost like a little spiritual psychotherapy. We don't encourage that. We'll even have a facilitator just say, no, please, don't, 
you know, do that, refrain from doing that, let them continue, let them work through it. And so, with that presence, um, that's really developed very strongly in our community. And it's worked so well that actually, in our community, after years of having these expression sessions and practicing these principles, we're now getting into higher and higher states of mind, really transcendent states, where there are those that, that really don't have or need expression sessions, neither do they find it helpful to just to sit in them. Um, because that was just like an earlier phase, and those techniques and those uh, opportunities are no longer necessary anymore. So it's getting quite harmonious, and in many of the centers, uh, there, there's expressions of joy that come out, but there's not this kind of constant parade of darkness coming out. It's actually, it's working so well that uh, it's, the mind is like, going higher and higher into what the Course calls true empathy, which is what, what's real and what's true. But there had to be a great allowance and a great permission to go through that process of allowing the darkness up. And you can practice that, of course, in a relationship or in a small group. I know uh, Sundari has had some of that out here, and Serena's had some expression sessions. There are those out here that have been using uh, some of those, and and it's the presence underneath that's the most important. Uh, not just trying to speak thoughts and, and kind of um, let all these emotions up like a volcanic reaction without any discernment. And I think as you go along, you've, you do find that if you don't have a trusted friend or a group, then there's a lot of discernment that goes into getting in touch and sharing things, because it, things can easily be misinterpreted. And you almost feel like, you know, one step forward, two steps back, if you've shared in a way that really wasn't appropriate, or helpful, or guided. If there wasn't a sense of discernment, then it can almost seem like a setback. And we did work with that a little bit with the Chinese groups too, because um, a lot of the online groups, um, they miss interpreted the guidelines. And so there was all these, like a vicious cursing going on in some of the groups, and, and there would be some course teachers over in China just saying, I don't really think uh, this is what was intended, probably because it was online and there was, you know, people, it was just uh, type chats, a lot of them, then there wasn't the sense of, of uh, holding back like people do if they're in the proximity with others. People will hide behind online avatars and presences and so forth and symbols. But um, those things evolve too. I think at some point people start to realize that's not working either. That's not the intention of that practice. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. That's a good question. That really gets down to the heart of things. Anything coming to mind for you on that? I don't know, but we'll see what comes out. <laughs> yeah? I'm still stuck at um, someone in an expression sent session calling someone else fat. Um, I can't imagine any reason to call, to tell someone that they are fat in a loving way. I don't know, I, I can't imagine any helpful purpose that would serve. And it, I try to think, man, I, I just, I listened to what you were saying and I can think, but that hasn't answered the question. He's not answering the question. And then I wonder, well, what is the question? And the question was, how can a guy like that be in A Course in Miracles? Which is, he's not, people like that, people like that aren't supposed to be in A Course in Miracles. And so I, I realized, oh man, there's just this outrage going on and finger pointing, going on left, right, and center. And I don't know what I wanted from your answer but I didn't get it. 
It's a really annoying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, that is so beautiful. You're having an expression session already. <laughs> <laughs> right here. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's so important. Like the Course is saying, it's just all projected. Everything is projected. The whole world, in fact, not only the thoughts. And so, when we see that we have thoughts coming up in the mind and we project like anger about that, then it's something that we cannot see within ourselves, the Course says. Mm -hmm. So it's this thing like Byron Katie, you probably heard about Byron Katie and how she turns around the thoughts. Like whatever we we're reacting to, if we swap it around and look at our own thoughts about it, like, do I think I am fat? If I'm getting upset that someone is saying that someone else is fat, do I think that I'm fat? And so that's more like on the surfacey level, so to speak. But really, when we have practiced this, what you've been saying about all of the projections and all of that, it's like all about the fear of being present, fully present, and not having anything that touch. That our mind can be so still that we just allow it to be in this vastness. As all of those thoughts are thoughts that we want to put there in the way of the connection with love, in the way of the connection with the presence. So whatever those thoughts are, it's always something that we want to distract ourselves with. And when we get the help and support to, to look at them without any guilt or any blame or any shame, then we are released. And it's this beauty that we can allow ourselves to be. So I feel it's so beautiful to have the opportunity of, of hearing what seems to be projections, but you know, so, so much, because then it's like, if we have reactions about it, it's our own problem. And that's what the Course is saying. It's like, whatever is happening on the screen, if I see a problem in it, that's how I want to see it. Perpetuating the ego. Yeah. So, I've had some darkness show up in our family, um, pertaining to a death, and it's the death of my father. Um, and it's really, if this is a projection, and this whole experience of projection, it's, it's really for myself being the contact person, power turning, but not on the physical realm, of forgiveness of some stuff that had taken place that um, sped up his passing, if you will. And uh, so if that's projection, how do you forgive and let go and, and embrace, if you will, bring light into it, a situation like that? Yeah, you might say that it's the Holy Spirit's convincing job to, to convince the mind that, that the world that you perceive is not separate from your mind. So if we go back to all the great spiritual teachings that say there seems to be a subject and an object, or a perceiver and a perceived. And if you look at those Course in Miracles workbook lessons, they're really helping you get in touch with your thoughts, which not everyone's touched with all their thoughts, and start to make the association that, that all the, Im the thoughts that I think I think, and all the images that I think I see are actually the same. That there really is no external world but projection makes it seem as if there is something external to the mind. And so thoughts are not seen as, as images, they're, they're seen as separate. Mm -hmm. Think of thoughts as, as kind of these invisible things that are whirling around inside of an individual mind. And the external world is completely different from those thoughts. And the Course, through the workbook training, is teaching you that they're the same, and that the only way you'll have peace of mind is to let them go, completely, you know, without any exception. So, um, when, you, when we're talking about thoughts about death, also this is a world where there seems to be external causation, and like something that would speed up someone's death, there can be a lot of opinions on that, and a lot of discussion and, and judgments that can go on around that, and as you practice with this more and more, you just start to see these, 
these judgments and these thoughts are, are in mind to be released, which is lesson number 23, I can escape the world I see by giving up attack thoughts. But the trick of the ego is it seems like it's made up a, a projected world of duality, and so attacking and being attacked seem to be very, very different. One seems to be the victimizer, one seems to be the victim, and the training of the workbook is to show you that actually they're both the same. That attack thoughts are just attack thoughts, but you can't give them up as long as you keep splitting them up and thinking, oh, there's one to be pitied and one to be blamed. Mm -hmm. You know, start projecting it out that way. So it's really undoing this idea of a dualistic world when the split of trying to hold on to the spirit's thought system and the ego's thought system is intolerable. It's like trying to hold on to light and darkness. Right. And then that gets projected out into the world as if the conflicts, the wars, the disagreements, the fights, the struggles, the challenges are all external. Whether it's between people or between countries, whether it's between the individual and, and society, or even when you take a walk in nature and a mosquito comes up and bites you, and it seems like there's a conflict between the mosquito and that and, and a little red bump appearing that itches, you know, there's, there's an irritation, but it's still a projection of, of that split in the mind, and that's what we're trying to heal. And also, the discernment comes in. I, I'll go back to the original question here too, because uh, about the, the fat. Uh, the context of that was, this is a husband and wife. I don't know, that might not make it any better initially. Uh, but um, it was also in the context of being called into a very deep calling, of wanting to end the cycle of denial and repression, and wanting to speak freely and openly. And some people might say that's not really nonviolent communication, uh, saying that someone's fat. But it was said in the context, I have thoughts about you being fat. Those are like expectations around, you know, body shape and size and all kinds of things that, that are just part of the self-concept of the ego. And so this was the context of two people, husband and wife, at a, a long retreat, I believe it was a four, week retreat, wasn't that the first one, or that, that was that context, and, and starting to just open up about the thoughts and the emotions. And the other thing I think that's important is that, that wasn't really an expression session as we're talking about it, because that involves more of the context of a group. This is a husband and wife who are on a spiritual journey and who have kind of made a covenant or a pact that they're not going to hide these thoughts from each other and they're, they're going to open their hearts up upon invitation. And so, it's a lot different when you have an invitation. Uh, when you have a relationship where there's enough strength and love and trust in a relationship where you can invite that, as opposed to that coming out of left field. It, it, by itself, taken out of context, it, you know, it could seem to be outrageous, completely outrageous. Uh, something that would never be encouraged, but in the context of that, which is, it, it is so important, I know that when I practiced the Course many years ago, and I got very, very joyful and very, very happy, that people started showing up at my doorstep, literally saying, I am your student, I am your student, and I, before long I had, it was like instant pudding, I had like a, a whole group of students, which I did not plan on at all. Where are we going to go? Where, we, where do we put these people? And what do we do with this? Um, and then, very quickly though, it was, I said, well, really, this is not about correcting your brother. Many people know that passage in the Course about don't correct your brother, because your brother is the Christ. And the only way that that makes any sense in a spiritual context is if there's an invitation. So when the students would say, please point things out to me, please, uh, if you see anything, say it. And that kind of invitation is very, very different from the context of just comments, open comments, between strangers, where there's no invitation. The invitation, I found, was very important because I would never even be 
begun to work with the students in a very close way unless I had that invitation first. In fact, I had one woman who was married and um, her husband was not a course student, he was Orthodox Jewish and, you know, we, I would get together and go over to their house. She gave me the invitation to point out everything. He did not. Mm -hmm. I would sit with him, watch the basketball games, we would laugh, have just all this joy, and he would occasionally overhear some of our topics, and he was quite curious, but he never gave the invitation to point anything out. She did, and so it was kind of fun in the context of those two because I was quite lighthearted with him, and, and I could be very direct with her. And people would say, wow, you, it's an amazing how you work differently with both of them, but it was based on the invitation. The invitation was there, uh, so that made a big difference. And I think that really, you can apply that pretty generally, that um, most of the people in this world don't study metaphysics. Uh, they're not all philosophy majors, and they don't really want you prying <laughs> in their minds. <laughs> it's like, thank you very much. They may smile, change the subject. Um, talk about the weather, you know, change the conversation completely because they're just not ready. Uh, and, and the Course is not telling us to try to heal people. It's really about going inside and realizing it's always our lesson. It's our lesson in mind and it's, there's no exception to that. So that starts to give a little bit of context to the nuances that we're talking about here. And there are a lot of them. There's a lot of uh, discernment that's required. Yeah, and that's the same thing for the community too. If you would be at any of our expression sessions, you, you would just have to say yes to that you want to be there. And so that's the first thing, <laughs> of course, like this invitation. And also the same thing I'm feeling like with relationships. Jesus is talking about it in the Course, that this is something that is very powerful for us to enter a relationship together because you will really see all of the stuff coming up. And that's, again, upon invitation. I've even had my husband once, he was in such a rage. <laughs> and I was just kissing him and <laughs> holding him. And he just went, you, and blah, 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 blah. And I was just kissing and holding and <laughs> rah, rah, rah. <laughs> and then he just went like, you know, it was more silent and then silent and relaxing, relaxing. And then... He was just like, oh. <laughs> so it's this thing that we, we never know how it's going to look like, and the Spirit's got it. And if it's, if it's a group like that, it's totally facilitated by someone that can hold the space there to help you go through it. And then once you have practiced that, that is something that you can bring in. If you do have a relationship and you go in and you say, this is actually fully for the healing of the mind, and that is your goal then it's a whole other situation than having one that is in for the healing of the mind and one that is not thinking of that. So it's, it's totally different things. And what you, your explanation, I had no idea. I had such a, a sense of pain, a split, just like it was a chocolate chip cookie made of nuts and bolts and bits of cement stuffed in here until you said married couple. And all of a sudden, something shifted, mm -hmm. and I felt such love for that couple. Mm -hmm. Just love. And I still, and there's still a part of me that, that attacked that unknown person who called someone I don't even know fast. <laughs> um, that chocolate chip cookie is, is still in there. It's like it's just wedged in there. Yet, there's a, a real conflict going on and it's visceral, but the idea of <coughs> oh, loving that couple, to have the courage and the love to go, th to do that, mm -hmm. it just, it's really having quite an effect on me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. That's in the beginning when I was with David. I just had so many thoughts about David and the body of David and all of it. And it was just distracting me. I could not join with him fully because I had those thoughts. And I was just like, I don't know what to do. It was like 
the first day we met when we were in Stockholm or something, and it was just like bogging down my mind, and I was like, I gotta say this to you, David. And we were partnered up too. And so I, I had to say it, I had to say it. I was like, I know that we're guided to be together, but I think this and this and this and this. And he was just like, aww, you know, <laughs> just smiling at me. And, you know, this beauty of just being able to say everything. And then when we've said it, you know, we can, we can help that, like you were saying, like what seems to be contracted in the heart, to just loosen up and loosen up so that we're not carrying that heaviness of, of just continue projecting because that's that's ending when we don't hold on to anything anymore. We just let everything go. That's not the reason why. That's not the reason why. The problem's not out there. You have to look inside. That thing that someone did. The words that seem to hurt are only in your mind, and that's where you must search.